Hey, well, welcome everyone to the Sustainability Committee of Tar City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, um, on this Thursday, October 20th, 2022. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Can we please get a roll call? Chairperson Dory Larson. Here. Member Taylor Mandalu. <clears throat> Member Denise Menino. Here. Member Karen Gallagher. Here. Member Robin Sanger. Here. And Member Carol Mickett. We hey, Chairwoman. I forgot to lock my car. May I step outside to yeah. do that real quick? Please do. Back. Okay. Did, um, Robin, did you, <coughs> it, are we missing somebody? <clears throat> I was, I was going to talk about that under to okay. see more, but I mean, I can mention. No, I just more. didn't want to overlook somebody. Yeah. Um, in the roll call. I'll just mention it now. Um, Vice Chairperson Paul Robinson has decided not to renew his term and is not planning to attend our meetings as a um, committee member anymore. Oh, okay. So we did, you received notification asking for an uh, excuse for Dr. Mickett and for Taylor? Correct. Correct. So can we get a motion to? Motion to um, excuse their absence this evening um, for Taylor Mandalu. Uh, we're supposed excuse. to vote on this. And, uh, second. Okay. Second. Oh. And then we yeah, need to wait so for Robin to come back to Robin vote. To come oh, back. I think so, yeah. We'll just hang on a second. Okay. Was, that, uh, was that motion for both um, Taylor and, and Dr. McKitt? Or? Correct. I didn't know that we could combine them, but yes. <laughs> oh, can you? I think they're supposed to be separate. Separate. Okay, we'll do it. Well, then I'll make a motion. But at least that's what we did yeah. I remember I think a while the back. Yeah. During COVID. Okay. Right? We're, we're all learning now. Yes. Do we just we're we're getting getting second and straight and on thing. the straight and narrow Robert's rules. Right. <laughs> I suppose we can't make a second motion when there's still a motion mm, up on the floor that nobody's going to vote, right? <laughs> I think so. It's okay. That was quick. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor to excuse Taylor. Taylor Mandalou's absence for this evening. And there's a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we'd like to, uh, an, a second motion to excuse Carol um, Mickett's absence for tonight. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So the next item is the approval of minutes. So we have minutes from... August 18th, and also from the September 15th meeting of this year. Everybody have a chance to take a look at those. Any comments or questions? Okay. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve both of those. Motion to approve both of those. Second mm -hmm. the meeting, the minutes. I'll second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So our next item on the agenda is discussion. First is consider approving Sustainability Committee Resolution 2201 to adopt rules of procedure for the Sustainability <coughs> Committee. So Robin, do you want to walk us through the update? Sure. Um, so I can kind of, if you all would like, I can scroll through it or we can just kind of talk about it. Um, but... It is the same procedures that I had brought um, to the previous meeting. I think it was um, maybe the July meeting. I have to look that up, actually, where we had initially started the discussion about adopting rules of procedures for the committee. So the content is pretty much the same as what uh, we had discussed previously with a few changes from um, suggestions from um, City Attorney Tom Trask. So those changes, I can walk you through those.
So those changes were <clears throat> writing clearly our meeting day and time, setting a specific day and time to receive the backup items to make sure that things go out promptly um, to make it easier, you know, for um, for everyone and for the public as well. Um, there was, um, he suggested um, really making sure that the items for the next agenda section is the appropriate time to set our agenda for the following meeting. So uh, making sure that during that time is when we're um, bringing up what we would like to see in the following meeting so that the public um, is well aware of what will be discussed in the following meeting. Um, additionally, a uh, suggestion from city clerk and staff were to outline our order of the meeting that we follow. So that's why I did that here where we have the call to order, the roll call, approval of minutes. We talked about having the public comment in the beginning and then throughout the meeting, like the BOC format, um, the discussion of old business and new business, which is kind of the, you know, the way we've been discussing um, our items anyway. With our, we start with our follow-up items, go into our discussion items um, for new business. Then we have items for the next agenda, staff comments, and committee comments. So all of that is outlined there. Um, City Attorney also suggested um, that we don't really have language in here about rescheduling meetings, that it's a, kind of difficult for the public if we do that. So it would be better to write and stick with our day and time of the third Thursday of the month here at 6 p.m. And if for some reason we don't have a quorum, then it would be better actually if that meeting were to be canceled than rescheduled um, in his opinion. So I kind of changed the wording there. And then of course, unless it's otherwise approved by the city manager, then if there's any sort of special meeting that needs to take place, that would have to be approved by him. And then I added in this one, we did have um, some questions um, about resignations. So I just kind of put that in clearly what the procedure is um, from the clerk's office for if any of you are ever at um, that point, hopefully not, <laughs> where you want to resign, that, but now you know how. So it's uh, that you would notify the office of the city clerk and collector in writing. Um, so that's really about it. I don't know if you, let me just make sure that's clear. But yeah, that's it. So uh, were there any questions? We had taken, or we were, at one point we were going to have some clarity on like what goes on the website and that sort of thing. And then right. it was the city attorney's recommendation to not include that in this resolution. Right. He said um, it in this resolution, that's not the appropriate place for that. That would be better accomplished through a memo from the city manager or um, even potentially from Paul, um, Paul Smith. So if you all want to move, want to move forward with that, establishing those rules for the sustainability website as we had discussed previously, and, and you would like that to be formalized, then we can take that step and have that memo drafted, um, or we could, um, you know, just adopt those rules informally. I think the benefit of formalizing it is so that in the future, if future members come on, there's some consistency. Okay. I just wanted to, like, because that was in the other, mm -hmm. the first version and then it was out, so I just wanted to, was there anything else that was in that was taken out or that we had discussed? Mm, that was pretty much it. And then um, just those other items I had, you know, pointed out just now as we went through about um, changing some of the language, um, kind of really ironing in on the items for the next agenda and the meeting times. Okay. Um, and then really outlining our flow of the meeting and public comment. So then the next step would be, and this is just a resolution that 
our committee is passing tonight, it does not need to go to the BOC because at one point we thought it needed to go there. So, right? Just right. clarify that piece as well. Yes. So for adopting rules of procedure, which this committee has not done yet, uh, that can be accomplished just through a, this would be a sustainability committee resolution. It would not need to go to the board of commissioners. Um, so if you all do approve it tonight, I have the, the sheet that you all would sign and say that you've approved it. Hmm. So where would it be formalized where people could see it? Would it be on the city website under our uh, committee thing? It would just be placed there? I believe, so. I believe so. That's a good question. I don't know why not. Okay. I should think to do that. Yeah. So we need a motion to pass this resolution, correct? Right. I will make a motion to pass the re resolution as it's written. Second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 And thank you for this, because I think it brings a lot of clarity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, so then I'm not sure how to handle the signature portion, if we should do that now or at the end of the meeting. Oh, I believe probably just I don't pass know it the around now. Protocol. Yeah, okay. <laughs> let's just sign it. That's not in here. There's no protocol for that. <laughs> <laughs> you need to put that in there. <laughs> and then it will be signed right away. Um. um. So you would sign it, uh, if you can see this, up here, and then um, don't fill in, and then I'll fill in this bottom part with the clerk. I just basically write yes or no that you that you um, approved it. So I think you just need to sign your name. All right, and then let's go ahead and move on while we're signing that. Um, <coughs> Next item is the review of the 2018 Greenhouse Gas Inventory Technical Report. So, Tommy, I think you're going to walk us through that, correct? Or Robin, who, who's, who's doing this one? Yeah. Um, if you'd like to. Sure. Do we have, uh, shall I pull the yeah, screen share? If you uh, just, it's already pulled up. Uh, it is. Just, okay. just scroll down, and it's the next document. Sounds good. It's all in one PDF file. Thank you, Chair Larson. Uh, today we'll go ahead and give a quick update on the uh, 2019 Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory. This was our first ever inventory. We finished the technical memo summarizing all the work and the sources of greenhouse gases. And uh, we really wanted just this to be an opportunity for review and discussion amongst the committee about um, you know different sources of emissions in the city and for y'all to learn a little bit more about the work that went into this. Um, we've reported this twice in the, uh, on this twice in the past, and these are the final numbers. And also, since y'all have had a chance to review the document a little bit, if there was additional questions, we've just provided this for discussion, and um, hopefully it will be a springboard for future sustainability action items. Um, <clears throat> for practical purposes, we can go through and I can answer any general questions. I've also got uh, my laptop available uh, after we run through the document. If there's anything like in particular detail, like uh, about fuel use or something in detail about particular electrical uses uh, amongst uh, different departments within the city, um, I can pull that information up and answer more detailed questions as well if needed. So, let's see. There we go. Can everyone see? Mm -hmm. All right. So, like every good report, it starts with a table of contents. Uh, we have an executive summary in here. I think uh, what we were trying to accomplish here, just going through, talking about the um, uh, the nature of greenhouse gases. We've got some interesting information for like the layperson about you know what is a metric ton of CO two. Um, again, everything in this report is done in met 
uh, CO metric tons of CO2 equivalents. So it's not all of the sources of emissions that uh, occur due to uh, electrical use or fuel consumption or water or wastewater treatment are CO2. Some of there's nit uh, nitrogen emissions and things like that. And the tool that we use, the ICLEI tool, which uh, we've discussed in the past, converts all of that into equivalent tons of CO2 to provide a common basis of comparison. Um, and that's also what te people tend to be most familiar with. So all in all, here's uh, the grand summary of where our uh, greenhouse gas emissions are coming from within the city. And again, this is targeted towards city operations, uh, not the community scale, uh, you know, uh, employee, com you know, like net commuters and things like that. We're mostly focused on, you know, what are the services that the city provides and uh, what are the uh, implications of that from an emissions perspective. So all in all, we, uh, in 2019, there were approximately uh, 9,200 tons of CO2 uh, equivalents uh, in emissions. Uh, the largest source of emissions reflects our um, most energy intensive service that we provide, which is water and wastewater treatment. Um, one thing to keep in mind throughout this uh, report is that this is largely a reflection of the types of services that our particular city offers. If we were a city like uh, perhaps um, like Clearwater, or I'm sorry, not Clearwater, maybe like Largo that did not operate a water treatment facility, the, that number would be quite a bit lower. Or if we were uh, someone like Pinellas County that operated a large mass transit organization, that would be in there too, and that would make everything else appear relatively smaller. So uh, that's an important thing to consider is, you know, that these are largely a reflection of the types of services that our particular city offers and uh, where our energy and fuel use occurs. Um, Again, water and wastewater was the largest group uh, for emissions, reflecting the energy intensive nature of water and wastewater treatment. The second largest sector for emissions was the vehicle fleet at about 1,700 uh, metric tons of CO2 equivalents. And then other city buildings and facilities was uh, 1,400 and some change. And streetlights and traffic signals was the kind of smaller group. And, uh, as a reminder on solid waste, there was very small sources of emissions here. Uh, this is reflective of the fact that um, the city's out, uh, contracted solid waste fleet is operated by waste management. So that actually goes, and that goes into the vehicle fleet uh, category in the ICLEI tool. Uh, solid waste facilities was heavily focused on landfills and um, our city landfill was closed many, many years ago. So this is basically a reflection of just the energy consumption for the, um, the scale house at the yard waste facility, and that's about it uh, for, for um, solid waste. So moving along, um, we did provide a breakdown again on electrical consumption. Uh, you can see here, the, we broke out the water and wastewater utility. In 2019, the water utility used about 7 million kilowatt hours of electricity, and the wastewater utility used about uh, 4.5 million kilowatt hours, and then you can see this category for parks, rec, and leisure activities were uh, uh, kind of the, the next biggest source, uh, again, with streetlights and traffic signals coming in uh, behind that. And you can see that the electrical consumption does not necessarily have an indicate, it doesn't necessarily um, lead to what's the largest source of emissions because this excludes fuel use, which was what uh, drives uh, vehicle emissions in 2019 because we didn't have any EVs at the time. Uh, again, you can see here relative quantities of electrical consumption. This isn't in uh, CO2 equivalents, this is just in kilowatt hours, but you can see the water utility is about 44% of city electrical consumption. Wastewater is about a third. And then... There's an amber alert. That's it's always off. very timely. Oh, uh, gosh. And so, yeah, you've got, and you've got about a, thir a quarter to a third of uh, our electrical consumption goes to all other city activities. Again, streetlights and traffic signals, general municipal government, police, public works, all that sort of thing. Um, running through some more, here's our vehicle fleet emissions. Again, these are final. They've been, had some minor updates since you saw them last, uh, mostly just record cleanup. Um, and you can see light trucks are the largest source of um, uh, vehicle emissions, and that's reflective of the fact that uh, light trucks, which include SUVs and Florida Explorer police cruisers, are the largest component of our vehicle fleet, reflecting a national change uh, from, you know, shift over time from passenger vehicles and sedans to small SUVs, which fit into the light trucks category. Um, 
heavy trucks and our solid waste contractor fleet are kind of the close second. And uh, one thing we always like to call out is that waste management does have a partial natural gas fleet. So that actually helps keep our emissions down, uh, which is uh, pretty neat. Again, you can see here relative quantities of fuel consumption within the city fleet. This excludes contracted services like, uh, like waste management. Uh, but you can see the police. They're a 24-7, 365 service. They're always driving around. They have special needs for their um, power usage and things like that for their computers and things like that within their uh, squad cars. And so they are the largest user of fuel in the city and a predominantly uh, gasoline-powered fleet. Uh, fire comes in a uh, a kind of distant second, and then other municipal activities, public works, wastewater, and uh, the water utility are all kind of in the same, uh, about the same scale. We did make some recommendations um, about next steps, some of which have already been implemented. So one of them was evaluating potential for additional solar energy capacity at the uh, reverse osmosis treatment facility. Uh, we have implemented that. That went to our board. Um, a few weeks ago, and um, it's we had our kickoff meeting last Friday, and we're proceeding with phase two of our RO solar energy project. Um, we also discussed potentially looking at energy efficiency improvements or off-site energy production for the wastewater facility, again, being the second largest energy consumer within the city uh, facilities. Uh, we also talked about creating some sort of more formal program for pilot testing uh, and integrating EVs into the vehicle fleet over time. We're slowly, again, rolling out some of our uh, uh, EV um, vehicles. We just took receipt, as we mentioned last time, of our first Ford e-Transit for the utility. And um, we've had some other Nissan Leafs and hybrids and things like that that have been in the fleet for a little while now. Um, and also working to create a staff team to develop and implement projects and reduce electrical power and fuel use consumption over time. That's been implemented since about the beginning of this uh, calendar year. Um, we've been slowly ramping that up and getting folks used uh, on our staff used to uh, seeing all these sorts of sustainability initiatives. And over time, as we get to more of the implementation phase, a lot of that will have to happen at the staff level. And that's where we'll be uh, doing those sorts of activities. Um, Additionally, as we move forward into the implementation phase, uh, an important step will likely be to develop some sort of system to evaluate projects and programs from an emissions reduction perspective. Uh, it's difficult to compare installing additional solar panels with um, installing with replacing vehicles with EVs, with implementing energy efficient uh, treatment technologies in the water or wastewater utility. So we need to have a common basis of comparison so we can make smart investments and see what gives us the most bang for our buck on a um, emissions reduction perspective. Um, and lastly, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, going a little bit more into detail on evaluation of vehicle fuel consumption by department. We've made all this information available to other departments. Uh, we've been working with fleet a little bit. Um, so other departments can have access to this information so they can make smart uh, decisions about their investment and their fuel use. Um, as we go through, uh, this was sort of our next steps. Uh, this is from the EPA. Uh, and basically, the process starts with creating the scope and, uh, and planning the inventory, which we did uh, a couple years ago. We, we collected all this data. We developed a plan. Uh, our next step is to uh, develop a plan for data collection procedures. We've kind of done that a little bit at this point. We've got some SOPs and a technical memo uh, or a technical appendix to help uh, folks in the future to collect this information. And the next steps will be goal setting and getting into the implementation phase again. Um, as we just run, I'll just run through the report really quickly. Um, We've got a breakdown on buildings and facilities with what electrical accounts go into each of these general categories, regardless of city department. Um, we've got a breakout on water and wastewater treatment uh, facilities. And again, here we've got a list of some of the key emission sources and what calculators were used in the ICLEI tool. Um, again, breaking out which, uh, elect which uh, accounts and which divisions are categorized in each utility. Um, and uh, the vehicle fleet, again, we've got a little bit of additional information there. This is from the 2019 vehicle fleet, so it's a breakout of all the different vehicles in the city and what departments and activities have which types of vehicles. Again, you can see light trucks called out, 
Uh, about 289 vehicles and 132 of them were light trucks. Um, fuel consumption by uh, vehicle class, more emissions data. There's similar graphs on um, uh, gasoline and diesel use that you saw in the, in the executive summary. Street lights and traffic signals. Again, this was heavily weighted towards electrical use. There's a lot of light bulbs out there. Um, solid waste facilities, we gave a little bit of a breakdown uh, saying exactly what we told you just a moment ago about this being primarily electrical consumption. And then we've got some conclusions at the back. Um, if anyone would really like to sleep quite well tonight, you can go and read the technical appendix on data collections and sources. Um, <clears throat> we spent quite a lot of time crunching lots and lots and lots of electrical data and uh, grid factors and uh, fuel reports and things like that. And so we've got a detailed breakdown of all the different sources of data down to gallons of fuel can you consumed at the, as an example here at the water and wastewater facilities for generator exercising and uh, generator needs. Um, so all of the information that went into how this inventory was compiled is all in the technical appendix. And one uh, kind of big change that we did have at the guidance of um, ICLE in as a part of our participation in the regional cohort was to remove grid losses from the inventory. Um, that was, uh, again, as you take electricity from the power generation stations to the end user, there's a certain amount of electrical grid loss that occurs. That's the nature of the grid. And so that was previously quantified within each category that used electricity. There would be a call out for water and wastewater utility grid losses or buildings and facilities, grid losses. And ICLE recommended that we've just moved that to the appendix. Um, we had talked about that with them in 2019, but they elected to have us move that out uh, in 2020 uh, as, as part of becoming more consistent with their 2020 efforts and participation in the regional cohort. So things would be a little bit more comparable for other, uh, for other municipalities. So with that in mind, that's a lot of information. Do you all have any questions about our greenhouse gas emissions or power consumption or fuel use? Yes. Uh, okay. How, sure. How, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, how do we stack up in comparison to other municipalities our size? That's a great question, and the answer is uniquely. Um, Again, this is that's one thing that we talked about a little bit when I presented this in the past. We originally were looking for um, other utilities and municipalities to compare to. At the time that we did this, we were actually fairly progressive. We were pretty far ahead of the curve. Um, most of the other facility or cities that had been doing this sort of activity that was publicly available uh, through like national databases at the time were like much larger places like Philadelphia or Atlanta or. Uh, you know, not small twenty to 30,000, uh, uh, you know, person uh, municipalities. So, um, again, we didn't really have a lot to compare to, unfortunately. Uh, long term, as more of this data becomes available and as the regional cohort starts publishing more consistent data, we'll have a little bit more to compare against nearby uh, municipalities. Mm -hmm. But we don't really have that right now. So uh, the, I think ultimately this is a tool for us to start benchmarking, say, this is where we are, this is our key areas to focus on, and as we move forward and implement additional sustainability practice, we, we can compare back to where we started. And uh, maybe, uh, I'm not sure I understand, but the, the um, amount of energy that goes to the water treatment, mm -hmm. you know, that is unique to us, is that... that just simply because of the type of water that we have, that we had to install um, reverse osmosis because of the brackish yeah, that's, water, uh, and that d makes it different than Largo? Yeah, uh, the energy consumption in a water and wastewater utility is, is very unique to each uh, you know utility. Um, if you're in rural Marion County and you have fresh upper Floridan uh, drinking water, you can basically pump it out of the ground with a very minimal energy cost, inject a little bit of chlorine, and sort of send it on its way to the distribution system. That's not what we have here. We have a salty, brackish groundwater as our water source, which necessitates a little bit more energy-intensive treatment, which is reverse osmosis. Our RO is uh, one of the more energy-intensive treatment technologies, but it's really the only scalable technology that most folks are implementing for uh, removing salinity. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. Um, can you maybe 
help me understand like diesel, the amount of metric tons contributed by diesel versus gasoline or how the, what the, do they both contribute? They must not contribute the same, but how does that work? Do you know? Uh, they don't contribute equally. Um, it has to do with, um, you know, it's at the end of the day, it comes down to some basic stoichiometry, you know, good, good, good old fashioned chemistry. You know, if there's a certain amount of carbon and you fully, uh, incinerate it, um, you know, there's going to be a certain amount of CO2, uh, emitted per quantity of energy. So the ICLE calculator luckily takes care of all of that. So when we put in uh, gallons of gasoline for light trucks versus gallons of diesel for light trucks, mm -hmm. it automatically uses national fleet factors to convert that into equivalent tons of CO2. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Is there any opportunity for biofuels to be part of what is used? By the diesel fleet, um, I believe we do most, it in some cities with buses and. Sure. Yeah, I, I think the answer is uh, you know obviously there's always potential for that sort of thing. We haven't done a detailed assessment of that yet. We're really focused on just detailing where our energy consumption is going currently. Mm -hmm. um, and most diesel has some sort of blend of, uh, of biofuels in it nowadays, uh, either like five five to twenty percent something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that is something we could continue to look into over time. Although I do think realistically we'll probably be, the general industry trend teams seems to be towards electrification. Mm -hmm. Which is awesome. So, so now that we have this data from 2019, um, what's the process for goal setting for reducing gas house emissions? Uh, Robin, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> So uh, we're still evaluating the next steps that we should take from here. Um, we will be working with the city manager. He will determine uh, how best we should share this with the public and with the board of commissioners. So that's kind of our next step. Uh, we do have setting a carbon reduction target as a action for the sustainability plan. So that will be evaluated in the early stages of the sustainability plan. And in the meantime, we'll just keep tracking and uh, continuing with data collection. So I guess a follow up to that. So when, can you explain the process then like of establishing what a good goal would be? Like, is there national standards that we want to set it to? Like it's typically like, below 2005 levels by a certain date, something like that? Um, yes, so ICLE um, is the organization that uh, we, you know, we use their software to do this uh, inventory and it's kind of the national, nationally most popular um, inventory software to use uh, at this point for municipalities and they actually uh, can work with municipalities to determine a carbon reduction target that is science-based that makes sense for your area. So we'd be working with them to help determine the best um, science-based reduction target. And that'll happen within six months, within three months, like when? Um, I, I really can't give that answer yet. Uh, we're still determining that. Uh, but, you know, like I said, it will be outlined as, a, as an action in the plan. Okay. I have a question about the recommendations because sure. there's like eight of them or so. What, how are you guys going to determine like which of the recommendations to prioritize? Um, <clears throat> I think that'll largely, that's something that we could talk about with, uh, with, y'all as the committee, you can make recommendations on which ones you think are important. Again, many of these have already been implemented, uh, but I think that's something that there's definitely an opportunity for discussion on as we get into, um, uh, sort of move into the implementation phase of the, the sustainability plan. Um, you know, some of these things, uh, most of these things are things that we anticipate we are fairly likely to do, um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, creating a staff team, implementing more solar. Uh, these are things that are kind of beneficial to the city in general. So uh, we know that there's going to be a continued evolution towards electric vehicles. So it makes sense to work with fleet to implement a pilot program because we're going to continue to get them into our fleet 
uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, we've already got some in, so it's in one way or another. We'll uh, over time the the fleet uh, our fleet folks will have to address how to implement that in a practical way. So uh, that's one. So I think probably the answer is all of those are relatively high priority and are fairly likely to happen over oh, over the next several years. And some of them have already proceeded. Again, talking about forming the staff team. Um, you know, maybe things like creating the evaluation method for projects for emissions reduction, that would probably come after we do uh, target setting um, and get, you know, and start dedicating a little bit more uh, funding and prioritizing uh, different sorts of projects that are, that could achieve uh, energy or fuel savings and emissions reductions. Okay, and then I have a question about the not the RO plant, but the wastewater treatment. There's, you had mentioned in there, modernizing with, like, upgrading the equipment. Do sure. we have a, an idea of, since that's the highest amount of emissions, like, what that'll, if we modernize the equipment, how quickly that'll reduce emissions, or by what amount? Uh, yeah, that's that's a great question, actually. Um, so again, the, the wastewater facility was built in the 1980s. It currently uses um, uh, the original style uh, mechanical aerators. Uh, at the end of the day, wastewater treatment's about adding oxygen to give the microbes enough uh, oxygen to eat all of the uh, contaminants and things like that in the wastewater stream, and that takes energy. So um, one thing that we did identify, uh, the facility's been heavily upgraded over time. Uh, we have it in the budget over the next couple of years to modernize the, and we have an, a master plan now to modernize the electrical system. They'll probably, be, as we move to a modern electrical control system, there'll be some energy savings there. Uh, we haven't quantified that yet, but long-term, uh, as we go to retrofit the facility, um, perhaps over the next 20 years, um, it's going to, it, within the next, within the 20-year planning horizon, it's going to turn 50 years old, so it's going to need some rehab. It's going to need a little bit of work to turn it from a 50-year facility into a 75 or 100-year facility, and uh, one thing that we're starting to look at is maybe replacing the uh, mechanical aeration system with a modern diffused air uh, bubble aeration system. That typically comes with a 20 to 30 percent reduction in energy use uh, for that system, which, mm. you know, that's not all the energy used at the at the plant. Uh, there's also energy for pressurizing the water to send out to reclaimed distribution and things like that. But just that out the gate, just ballparking it, maybe we could get 10 to 15 percent reduction in total wastewater uh, treatment plant um, energy use with that one project. Although it would be. Yeah, a couple million dollars to implement, but it would be part of a facility modernization. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. I think those were my questions. Anybody have anything else that came up? Did Carol have um, some that she emailed? Um, or was it answered? I think she was concerned about the, the um, waste management trucks, whether that was included in our um, inventory right or contracted vehicles. yeah she uh, made a comment of you know perhaps in the future that could be part of the kind of procurement process for um, selecting our solid waste contract in the future is like considering their uh, emissions as well um, which I think is a really interesting idea yeah I think that's a really neat uh, idea uh, I don't recall if we put it in this document, but I think that's something we included in our uh, recommendations from the, the action items from STAR, right? Is uh, something about uh, procurement uh, procedures? Right. Um, I think there's an item related to that. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, it would be like adding the fleet emissions, how low it is as a part of the rubric for selection for waste treatment or for the waste solid waste pickup is or that contract for the contract yes right yeah that was what um what carol suggested which is a neat idea yeah i do think we might have to i mean waste management continues to be our you know contractor and they are you know in this case quite progressive on implementing uh compressed natural gas as part of their their fuel sources for their fleet um, I do believe that contract just came up for renewal yeah we just it, did it this year yeah just this year so 
Um, perhaps that would be something we would take a look at uh, five, six years out when it comes up for renewal again. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you. I, I continue to just be like curious to understand the timeline and how quickly we can get some goals set and get like, sure. that's where I'm really pushing. So, I but that. I totally uh, appreciate all of this. You know, there's a lot of work that went into this analysis. And uh, one more question. Sure. Yep. You know, uh, yeah, just one more thought. There are a lot of city buildings, fire department, police department. Um, are any of them using solar? for part of their facility, or any of their facility? For police and fire? Right. Um, I think they are evaluating that for the new fire station. They were looking into it. And then also for the um, new cops and kids building, they were looking into that as well. I think currently our main solar energy uh, facility, obviously, is the reverse osmosis Water. plant. They've got mm -hmm. quite a bit of solar panels out there. And uh, we do have a small solar installation at the wastewater treatment facility on top of the old uh, chlorination building. Um, I don't know if there's other, I'd have to get back to you on any other city facilities. It would be probably outside of our department. It would be interesting to see, you know, how much reduction we could get just from more solar in all of those city facilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, one kind of takeaway that we had from doing the last um, round of uh, solar for the reverse osmosis facility and just looking at the scales, mm -hmm. uh, we're doing quite a lot of surface area of uh, solar on phase two. Um, and uh, that's going to bring us up to 15%, r uh, roughly 15% of annual energy consumption at the reverse osmosis plant. But I think our kind of our takeaway from there was really to get much beyond that, we would have to have a lot more area and it would probably go... Uh, beyond what um, what we have available for, like just roof space and things like that. Um, but uh, again, uh, Paul has us enrolled in the uh, solar that solar energy program through uh, Duke Energy, mm -hmm. so we're going to be participating with them uh, through like a credits basis in uh, their development of you know offsite uh, solar energy and uh, using that as part of our energy mix, uh, not directly implemented by the city, but through the power company. Right, and that was an action in the sustainability plan to a solar feasibility study for, for city facilities. I mean, is it completely out of the question to use buildings like the elementary school? Um, well, the elementary school isn't part of the city buildings. Um, it's owned by the school board. It's a whole different okay. yeah. ownership. Okay. Let's look at that space and think, wow, that is a great opportunity. But if it's not ours, okay. Yeah, I think that's probably, uh, Robin's correct, probably as we move forward and do like new structures, that's probably a really good opportunity to, op to look at the opportunities for, uh, for solar energy uh, in, in those, uh, those areas as you're building new structures to, uh, you know, sometimes a retrofit's not feasible from a structural perspective or the roof's not, you know, wouldn't support or something like mm -hmm. that. So I think there's been a little bit of discussion at City Hall as well, but there was concerns about the roof or something like that. There's been some, um, I think the, the safety building, one of the ARPA funding buckets was going to replace, replace their roof or repair their roof. It was a big hunk of money going towards that. I'm wondering if it would be feasible to, when they're fixing the roof, to see if there's any way to add solar as, as things get retrofitted and, and uh, improved. You know, just see if that's in the equation at all. Okay. Yeah, we can, we can look at that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. All right. Our next item is upcoming chairperson elections and annual update. <clears throat> Do you want to take this one, Robin? Sure. I'm just... Uh... I'm just trying to put the agenda back up here. It's freezing. It's freezing. Okay. I'm just joking. Because I'm wearing my freezing. I've got layers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, for 
this item, um, yeah, I was I was gonna I was going to announce under this item that um, you know our our vice chairperson Paul Robinson um, decided not to uh, continue with another term for the sustainability committee, um, and so the city clerk's office is uh, currently working on. Um, coming up with their list for reappointments to city boards, uh, cit citizen advisory boards, uh, which the you know, community can apply for that, and then uh, that will go to the Board of Commissioners, and they will um, select through the process um, a new um, committee member. Um, so that was part of this item. Just wanted to give that update. And then that being said, also, um, in the establishing resolution for the Sustainability Committee, uh, every January the committee uh, is to elect a new chairperson and vice chairperson. So I don't know if, I don't think you all have done that <laughs> in the past few years, but um, we can do that this January. And so I just wanted to put that on everyone's radar now. Um, I did ask the clerk's office if we need to elect an interim vice chairperson. Uh, they said we do not uh, need to do that. Um, and then the annual update, uh, whoever is the chairperson provides an annual update to the Board of Commissioners in January. That's also in the resolution for the Sustainability Committee. So I'm just putting that on the radar now that at our, um, probably December meeting, but we could start the conversation at the November meeting um, about what we would want to include in that report. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we're thinking about that early on. We've previously done the annual report, but we've done it in May, May, June, correct? You did it. I think we did it in January, right? I thought it was March. It was my, like, I thought, it was, I thought it was my first month on the job. and <laughs> But it hasn't always consistently been January, I think, is... is. Yeah, I don't, I don't... I'll look at the wording of the resolution. I don't think it has to be in January, but, um, but at the start of the year, basically. Um, but, I'll, yeah, I'll look at our resolution to see... So I'd first like to start by thanking Dr. Paul Robinson for his three years serving on the committee. I mean, that was a lot of work that he put in to get us to where we are. So I'd like to publicly thank him and all of his effort for uh, for helping lead this group. Um, and then just wanted to mention that, so my term is also a three-year term and it's up in October. And I'm not necessarily, I'm just going to, be very honest. I'm not necessarily interested in staying on for three additional years, but when I spoke to the city clerk, they can't, she can't, you can't change the term of the position. So I can't just say like, I'll do it for one more year and then, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so it is going to be like a three-year term that, um, that I will start, but I likely will not go for three more years. I'm just saying like, I'm getting tired, <laughs> you know. Um, and also to that point, um, I'm not looking to continue chairing the committee, um, because I, I just feel like I missed three meetings this year, and I, it's a lot to, um, like, I feel bad when, when I have to miss, and uh, so, and I just know with family stuff that there's probably going to be more of that coming up in this, this year, um, so just throwing that out there that, please, someone, um, and I, so what I'll intend to do is just, I'll obviously stay through December and then whoever is the new chairperson will start in January and then continue on until mm -hmm. it makes sense. And I think my term was two years um, and it was renewed. I think that you renewed. I was one year. What, one year. Taylor was one year, I believe. Yeah, so the terms are all different. Yes. Like mine and Paul's were three year. <laughs> so whoever's taking, you know, it'll be that mm -hmm. three years so and then also whoever would like to you know that new person in January if they would like to do the presentation to the uh, board of commissioners that would be awesome too I don't have to take ownership of that 
Just, I think for consistency's sake, you should. I think that's the best idea. <laughs> Personally, I think consistency is really important at this time I, in our evolution. I do as well. Okay. Well, I'm just gonna throw that. I'm just gonna throw that. Okay. okay. You've done such a great job. Uh-huh. You have. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's it's not really that that much more. It's it's like setting up, you know, like having a planning call with Bob and ahead of the meeting, and then debriefing after to make sure that we both heard the same things and have got everything lined up for the following meeting. So mm-hmm. consider it. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts on that item? All right. Let's hear about the Solar United Neighbors Solar Co-op. Um, oh, I got shocked. Oh. <laughs> I was going to mention this at the last meeting, um, but we you know, ran out of time. So I just thought, why not uh, kind of go into a little bit more in-depth discussion about it at this meeting. Um, let's see. OK. So um, is, is everyone familiar with the Sun Solar Co-op, or ha- has everyone heard about that? Here. Which one are we talking about? Because I have um, item 2D, yep. the Solar United Neighbors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that what we're looking at? or is Right, 2D. Okay. Wait, wasn't it D? Yes, so 2D. Okay. Um, so the Florida um, Solar United Neighbors is a nonprofit organization, and they help to kind of organize these um, solar co-ops. Um, and they're doing one this year for Pinellas County. This is their presentation, but it, it gives good information. So I'm just kind of going through this here. Um, so, um, yep, so this year they're doing it in Pinellas County. They do them in various counties in, in the state of Florida. And then the National Sun, they do it nationwide. Um, this year's co op is being supported by the city of Clearwater. And there was the opportunity for um, the local municipalities to join on as community partners. And what that basically just means is helping, you know, committing to help spread the word to our residents. So um, I brought this forward to the Board of Commissioners. We did an an ordinance, I believe, um, in our, one of our, September meetings, I believe it was. Let's see. Yes, in one of our September meetings. So we did this ordinance. um, No, resolution. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Lots of terms. So we did a resolution, uh, just kind of voicing that uh, we're supporting this initiative, and this was approved by the Board of Commissioners. Um, so then that allowed us to join on as a um, community partner for this solar co-op. Um, and the co-op is available for any Pinellas County resident. Um, it is at no cost to them. It basically gives them the opportunity to attend information sessions and work directly with the Sun organization for any questions they might have about solar and going solar and what that means. Um, so it's you know, an educational process. And meanwhile, if they choose to participate um, and if it makes sense for them, you know, their roof, it's feasible you know, with their roof. And you can also get, a, I think, a roof assessment through this program. Um, then they have the ability to uh, get a discount for installing solar in their homes um, because everybody participating in the co-op is basically you're buying in bulk and um, it allows the installer to give a discount. And um, a panel made up of uh, community members is the one who, they're the ones who actually do the selection process and determine which installer to use. So it's a community driven um, initiative So it's just uh, all around kind of a good opportunity for for residents to learn about solar. And then if they want to, kind of a low pressure way, they can um, continue forward and actually purchase solar for their homes. And uh, I think I have a slide on. uh, 
the uh, example of pricing. Um, and this is just some kind of interesting information in their presentation about, um, I think that these, these figures might be nation, might be nationwide, but uh, these figures are for Pinellas County, um, the number of homes installed, jobs created, because they have done this type of co-op in Pinellas County previously, and Tarpon Springs actually supported it in 2017 when they had one. But this is just some example of the cost savings that, um, that you can receive. And then now with the new um, federal tax credit going back up to 30%, that gives some uh, you know, additional savings for uh, participants. I think that's about Could you go everything. one more, go up? Oh, sure. Yes. No, to the, yes, thank you. And it's currently ongoing right now. Uh, I think the window will close some some point either some point in December or when they reach I think 200 participants because there is a cap at the the amount that an installer can handle like um, working with. So it's still open now for people to sign up, and uh, soon we'll start kind of doing some Facebook posts to spread the word. I have it going in the utility bills and the news and notices section with information about this for, I think, for two months. Um, and then I'll also have some flyers in city facilities. And you said the cutoff is sometime in December? It is, it might, it might say on here somewhere. Um, I'll have to verify that cutoff date, but I know, I know that it, it is at some point in December or when they get 200 total participants. And they have information sessions scheduled. Um, they're, I think, in person and you have the ability to participate on Zoom. They had one uh, that got canceled due to the hurricane that they were looking to reschedule, so another one might open up as well. And then they have all kinds of great information on their website. And um, uh, uh, Julia, who's organizing it, is a Tarpon resident, <laughs> which is great. Uh, and then this just has some some neat information. This 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 one is interesting because it kind of shows the history of solar co-ops mm -hmm. that they have done in Florida. So like all of the solar co-ops they've done, and as you can see, we did participate in 2017. And um, now we're participating again, which is great. Do you know how many um, individuals actually participated from Tarpon in 2017? Um, I, yes, I, she did send me that in an email. I, I can look it up real quick. It, it wasn't a whole lot. I want to say it was like six or seven. Well, it's um, a, it, like this is the first I'm hearing of the co-op at this point. Okay. Right? So... Um, for me, and so I'm wondering how that information is being disseminated because I have till December to decide, right, if I want to do this, and then if I do, I've got to determine if I have the cash flow because it's not a project that was necessarily mm -hmm. going to happen for me right away. So it, that's the reason I was asking the questions on the deadline, mm -hmm. um, as well as like the information session and how do we get that information out. So um, how often do you anticipate like the the this coming up if it's not if, if somebody can't jump in on your December this December one um, I know it was 2017 the last time we did it is there s any plan in the future for tarpon or and you may not be able to answer that for like any thoughts on whether or not we would do this again um, in the near future yes with speaking that? with Julia it sounds like they you know are very interested in having this be a regular um, co-op for Pinellas County um, in order for them to do it, they do have to get um, the funding, like a sponsor. So this year, City of Clearwater uh, funded it. Previously, City of St. Petersburg funded it. Um, but it's hard. It is hard to say when it might sure. happen. Like if it would be an annual thing, or if it would um, kind of happen just 
every couple of years as the funding is available. So I just want to mention a few things because I'm pretty familiar with Solar United Neighbors. I think that um, for like for Turpin residents, what's really important is that this is free for all of the residents to participate in. Um, so it's no cost. It's also no risk. Um, you're not committing to anything. Um, there is a listserv of other folks that have gone solar. So it's just a tremendous resource to be able to tap into and ask all of those detailed questions that, you know, if you, if you call up a solar installer, they don't have time to walk you through every aspect of it, right? So it's, it's a great way to learn more. Um, like I said, risk-free because, you know, you can sign up and say, yes, I want to, I want them, I want to learn. Um, but it's not, you're not committing that, yes, I'm going to purchase. Um, they do once, you know, once they have it capped, then the vendor comes out after they're selected, does an analysis of your home. You may not even be a good candidate if you've got a lot of shade or if there's, you know, some, and so it's nice to, you know, unfortunately there are some bad actors <laughs> in the solar industry and there's just, it's kind of like, who do you trust? How do you know that this is actual real information and it's, you know, factual? Um, so to me, that's the biggest benefit is that you're getting a whole lot of information from, you know, crowdsourced from other folks that have gone solar and understand the process and can kind of walk you through those questions mm -hmm. on the listserv. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can evaluate and say like, this is for me or no, this isn't for me. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, you've educated yourself a little bit more about it. Um, so there are, I just looked it up, there's 81 members of the 200 member goal right now. The co-op closes December 16th. Okay. And there have been, like in the St. Pete co-op in 2021, technically they would let you in to Tarpon if you, were, if you lived in Tarpon. It all really kind of depends on geographic, so they don't want to make it so big that the vendor would have, be having to drive across three counties to to be able to get to, you know, to do all of those uh, visits mm -hmm. and, and then the installs and stuff. So um, so I suspect that there will be additional opportunities, but to Robin's point, it does depend on the city partners putting up, you know, mm -hmm. the amount of money to, because there is a cost to them to employ <laughs> Julia and to, you know, rent the space to have the meetings and all of that. And in 2017, we were actually, I have volunteered with them. Um, we were at First Friday <laughs> educating, and that's how we were like letting okay. people know about it. So um, I think they've come a long way. And with Zoom, it makes it a lot easier to have virtual presentations as well. Right. Um, thank you, Dory. That was a great explanation of things. And um, it is interesting that they can filter by a uh, municipality. So when, after the co-op is, uh, after it has closed, um, and Julia mentioned, I, I could get that information from them as to how many participants were from Tarpon, hopefully more this time than last time. <laughs> and uh, you can see kind of, they can estimate various things like, you know, the cost savings and your ROI and then they can estimate things at a higher level, like regional level, like even I think she was um, saying about, um, what did she say? She, she had some pretty neat statistics. I'll have to look back, but even like going into green jobs and you know, um, jobs created, so they can track some pretty interesting information. So, so the six that uh, were members, were, did, do you know of that number, how many? Um, actually went through and through the entire process and signed contracts? Um, or is that not information that we... I don't know if it's six. It might be more than that. I, I'll go back and look at what she had sent me to see the number of Turpin residents. Uh, but yes, it was, it were, they were Turpin residents who went through the process. Okay. Um, right, and uh, I think one was actually Paul. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually, I didn't know that it was Sun. Um, he did mention going through the process of putting solar and what have you. But, um, My understanding is he was quite a happy customer. <laughs> well, I think when he shared that, he had a smile on his face. So, yeah. um, and, and then I have one, one other question, because I was, um, I'd like to see both sides of this. And it was interesting listening to, I mean, I knew we were going through the second phase over at the um, RO plant. Um, 
have they improved the lifespan of solar panels? Because I, I my, interestingly enough, in, in um, I was doing a little bit of reading in the um, EU. They anybody who installs has to provide the means to destroy the to, to remove and then do something to to uh, for the waste products right. in that. Um, and and uh, unless it's changed, we don't have some sort of federal standard for that. So no. your lifespan is typically 25, 30 years, correct? My, can you, some can go longer, some maybe not so much. Yeah, I, again, I'm not an expert on okay. solar panels, but I, I can say that um, that is something we looked at in phase two of the RO solar project, okay. and the panels that uh, we purchased are 30-year panels, and they have a guaranteed, um, like a guaranteed yield, like they're supposed to only deteriorate like at a certain percentage per year, and they're guaranteed over the 30-year span that at the end they'll have a certain percentage of the original nominal output, so, um, so what, pretty good lifespan on these. So when the city is done with those, there's not a great opportunity to recycle a lot of the parts of the solar panel. What happens to, is there a solar panel, I'm gonna be really, really elementary in this, a solar panel graveyard that we are now filling landfills when these solar panels are no longer functioning at the capacity that they, are, they need to, do, what, what, what will happen to this? So, and it's just, a, it's just a question of are we, like I appreciate that we have to do something right now to fix what's going on in society but mm -hmm. what happens in 30 years are we what, what are we creating for the 30 year mark when those solar panels are no longer functional where do they go what happens to them what that's that I, it's just food for thought i think more than anything else is if they're not if you if it's not cost effective to recycle them is anybody going to recycle them use the components that are or are they just going to go and fill the landfill at the end of the day, again, I don't. I don't know that anybody here is an expert. <laughs> to, <laughs> gonna do? I don't know. I don't know that anybody here is an expert to answer that question. It's just. It always goes back to you know. It, it, we have to do something now, and I understand that 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 we have to do something now. But again, I look at, in th you know, it's um. It, what happens in that thirty years? Are we. Are we forward thinking enough to say? In 30 years, we're going to need to do, or even sh sooner than 30 years, because I'm I'm going with 30 years from today's date, not mm -hmm. when people started using solar panels. Mm -hmm. So, is do we know? Is anybody out there looking at? <laughs> let's go 15 years. In 15 years, here's that first solar panel that's no longer functioning at, at the capacity we need to, so we need to replace it. What are we doing with it? That's uh, again, I don't expect anybody in this room unless they know know the answer to that it's more food for thought as we start moving forward with this i think it's bridging a gap at this point you know moving in the right direction but you're right i mean there's there are a lot of unknowns it does it just um i mean i i, I don't i don't know the answer so i just am throwing that out there for if anybody has information and actually knows what parts of the that can be recycled i mean there can the glass be reused from them? Can, you know, different components? And I don't know the answer, but if somebody does, anybody watching, um, I, I'm interested to know that because that's kind of what, you know, as we make these decisions moving forward, it's what's the impact later down the line. I, so, go ahead. Yeah, the, I think the short answer is yes, the, the silica, the glass, the, the different components can be recycled just like with an electric vehicle. Like with, with an EV, like 95% of the battery component can be recycled. Is it being recycled? Not yet, not now, it's happening. That's part of the IRA is they're funding billions of dollars to that R&D because it needs to be recycled right. because we don't need to be mining for additional resources. Uh, sure, mm -hmm. sure. And, and, and I mean, the expense that goes with it as well. Exactly. You know, is, is somebody really willing to incur that expense if there's not great return on their investment for recycling that material? So again, I'm just throwing that out there as I, I'm not even going to say devil's advocate. I just am curious to know what happens. So I think that we should have that on the next uh, <laughs> agenda so that we can um, get an answer. Okay, I did try to look a little bit and didn't find that, but I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily know who who to go to for the answer. So good food for thought. All right, thanks. Yeah.
Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to look into that further and bring it, bring back some good information for our next meeting. Um, I think that would be best. Oh, you're welcome. I think that would be, um, I don't know if you all are familiar with life cycle analysis, but that's kind of where, you know, environmental uh, economists, they'll kind of look into an item and then they'll look at the lifespan, life cycle, how it is recycled or destroyed and the environmental um, costs associated and um, so I'm sure that there's some information. Yeah, I tr like I said, I did a cursory look but didn't know exactly where to start on it. So yeah, thanks. Sure. I think one thing I can say is that the city is fairly active with recycling uh, mm -hmm. of its, you know, used products and stuff from our facilities. Like we have a great metal recycling program and that, you know, as that becomes more feasible um, or, you know, we start transitioning to having more different types of electronic waste and things like that, that uh, as those programs develop, I think that would be certainly something the city would be participating in over time. That's been our trend over time as well. Okay. No, I appreciate we'll that because I would like to know that the city has a, has a plan for those, those solar panels when, you know, it'd be nice to be forward thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just sent you an, just a link to something that I pulled up in the time that we've been talking, but yeah, you know, there are pros and cons to this transition because, it, you know, I, I feel like we're, you know, this is just a hunch, but I feel like we're on the edge of some tremendous breakthroughs in, in quantum physics that are going to lead us to a new higher ground for everything energy wise, mm -hmm. you know, some, some things that are amazing. I've listened to a lot of different conversations from quantum physicists who talk very positively about the future, but they're talking in terminology that is way beyond my comprehension. And yet they're, they're addressing transportation, energy. And, you know, it, it is not the way that we're looking at it right now. But sure. one of them um, says the next 10 years is going to be tremendous for enormous breakthroughs that are coming down the pike Good. as a result of a lot of the testing that they're doing to verify <coughs> equations you know using the large Haldron collider and all of you know they're getting their answers that they need so it's we're kind of at the uh, at the edge of a lot of beautiful things happening hopefully all right. Well, thank you for the discussion on Solar United Neighbors Solar Co-op. And um, so check it out, folks. Mm -hmm. Spread the word, please. Spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> With your neighbors. Is there in our, or can we get additional, like, um, because I know that we got information about the co-op, but maybe we could get some, like, social media posts that we could help amplify. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm going to work on some social media posts um, with our um, research information officer to put on the city's website. And then and you could send them to the committee, like maybe. To. Send them to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So moving on to the next item, which is keep Pinellas beautiful, illegal dumping cleanup contact information. So that was mine. I think that's yours. Right. Okay. So we had discussed, we had kind of, I wanted to bring it up at one of the meetings and then that was the same meeting where we said we needed to actually have a discussion before we could request to put things on the, the website. And so this is just really simple. Um, a couple months ago I went to, um, I guess it was Sunset Beach. I can't remember now. Um, and they had the Bebop from Keep Pinellas Beautiful that was cleaning up the beach. That, um, and I ran into one of the gentlemen there, and he's in charge of their program that picks up, uh, does illegal dumping. And he said, you know, I used to get calls all the time to come pick up uh, sofas or desks or ottomans on the side of the road, particularly Ancloak Road. Mm. Was, I mean, if you've ever driven there, I literally almost, <laughs> I almost hit a sofa because it was half stuck out in the road and the car was coming down the other way. And I was like, I can't believe this. But um, 
And I did not know at that time that there's actually a phone number you can call and he will physically come and pick it up and take it away at no cost to the city at no cost to an indiv any individual who reports it. But he said re in the last like year and a half, he said he hasn't gotten any phone calls. And I was like, well, I didn't know you existed because I certainly would have called you a couple times in the last year and a half because I've seen it. So they won't pick up just the regular litter. They won't come pick up your garbage because you forgot to put it out the night before or anything like that. But it truly is like illegal dumping. You're, you're driving down the street and there's a mattress on the side of the road or something like that. So he, he said, is there a way that you can get the word out? And I, and I was thinking to myself, um, could we put some of our, uh, not necessarily partners, but some of those people on our sustainability website, like Keep Pinehouse Beautiful or Tampa Baywatch or, um, again, just this resource number or email to reach out to, I think his name was Paul. I forget now, and, I, and I'm, so, I'm so bad with names, but, um, and that was just my comment was, if I'm, if I'm a member of the community and I go to this uh, a sustainability website, are there links that, that I could look at to find other things I could be doing? And so one of them, like we had talked about, reduce your use as an individual or what have you. Okay, if I didn't know anything about that, and I go to the sustainability website, and I'm like, oh, what's reduce your use or what have you? And then all of a sudden I look and I'm like, illegal dumping. And I say, oh, I could tell somebody about the, the mattress that's down the road or what have you. So my request was just um, to really, uh, because I had been asked by this gentleman from Keep Pinellas Beautiful to get that number out, was to put that number or website, uh, website address on our website. And if that's not the appropriate place, then um, maybe if we can do something like that on the city's website. But it got me thinking maybe mm -hmm. some of the extensions, Key Pine Hills, Beautiful, Tampa Bay, watch any of the other things, that, you know, resources mm -hmm. that the community could reach out to might be helpful if we have a link to them. Mm -hmm. What is that number? Well, I wrote it on the agenda that I didn't bring because apparently I printed it twice. So I'm going to get it for you right now. I think it's right oh, there did. on their website, too. It did, yeah. 727 gone G-O-N-E. -E. That's great. <laughs> yeah. And he'll come out. He he has his Is little it, trailer. Can you say it again? Yep. 727-210-GONE, G-O-N-E. -E. Do they do tires, too, to pick up anything? I mean, he basically said it's illegal dumping. Mm -hmm. So if somebody, I guess, has thrown, he's not suggesting people go and put those things out because they don't want to pay for them to be taken away. Much but if, cheaper than moving. It is much <laughs> cheaper than moving. I know it's I know it's not as far as going down to the county dump site, but um, no, he just his comment was, you know, people people tend to think certain areas of the road are appropriate to leave things and they're not, you know, obviously. So he said he I won't go as far as far as saying he said he was bored, but he did say he used to get a lot of phone calls from us, but he doesn't anymore. To pick things up, darn it. <laughs> he does. He wants to pick up big illegal couches or what have you. So I'm all for it. So I don't know anybody's anybody's thoughts. I don't know if there needs to be discussion. I don't know if there needs to be. If 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 the information has now just been broadcast and we don't need to go any further with it. It would be nice to get clarity on what, how things can be added to the website, or did we did we talk about it and and I zone? So yeah, that was <laughs> the one where we talked about it, and I had typed up like potential procedures, but then the city yeah. attorney, um, you know, mentioned that that's not really something that should go in official rules of procedures, but you know, what, what I had typed and presented before that could be like formalized through a memo from, from the city manager instead. Um, Perhaps um, Robin could take that to the city manager and say the sustainability committee would like this put out somewhere so people won't, you know, can get call out Ill illegal dumping. And then maybe there's a couple of places where it could go. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have though more resources. Uh, so I think I think there there's a, a, the ability to if you go to our website, um, you know we have different different areas like our articles, mm -hmm. our water so conservation, mm -hmm. um, and I was looking at it thinking where where helpful links are mm -hmm. is can we add some of those 
helpful links or external links, you know. It would be great. Um, yeah, so I don't know if we want to if we want to compile a list or as we think about them, we just uh, again I don't know how that information goes on there. What's appropriate to go on there? I think it could go on our website, but I also think it could go other places as well because and I that's agree. you know that's would be so helpful. Correct. So. Yeah. I and I I agree with that. Yeah, I think I I mean maybe um, I don't know what you think, Dory. If that could be an item where you all could come with what organizations you'd like to see on the website. Yeah, I think maybe we should put on the next meeting a discussion item about like because we didn't like with the like we didn't really put a pin in the website because we took it out of the proceed or out of the resolution. So like a conversation about like what goes on the website, how we get it on there, how often it gets updated, and then maybe Robin, you can get some feedback from us of like, do we because I understand that like updating a website is manpower for the communications department that <laughs> we can't just be like every month, like now we've got a new one, you know what I mean? Right. So maybe we look at doing like an annual, you know what I mean? Some kind of like we compile, compile, compile. They put it on every six months or something like that. Is that? Well, it depends on how hard it might not be difficult for them to do. They might not have a problem doing it. So I think just some understanding of what's reasonable for us to do. But like, I'd love to see that um, the uh, Solar United Neighbors up there too. But that's only good until December. So you know, it, just it is on it is on our our website. Oh well, then that's under done. resources. Yeah. But is she, are they going to take it down after December when the thing closes? I mean, I'd like some more clarity on how difficult it is to add and take things and uh, take things off and how how long of a lifespan those things need to be. Yeah, because that'll help us understand. What, what's appropriate. Like, yeah, what's, because I would think like putting on IFAS and all of the, mm -hmm. <laughs> like Brain Barrel classes, like all of the services that they offer, like people probably have no idea mm -hmm. what the extension office mm -hmm. can offer. Mm -hmm. And then other partners like that. Yep. And I think also some like, there, I, there are like scheduled events, like a large cleanup where they actually, you know, you put your big items outside. So maybe that's why people aren't just leaving it because they've increased the number of large item pickups. I, well, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, it's just, that's just twice a year. Okay. By the way, it's this Sunday. Yes. So anybody who <laughs> wants to watch this meeting or whatever, it is this Sunday. Put your stuff out. Um, it, it, it could be, I, I have a feeling it's just literally people who, I need to get rid of this sofa tomorrow and just try to dump it on this. It smells horrible. Exactly. I want to just dump it. And it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm dumping it on the side of the road. And I, unfortunately, I really do think that happens. You know, it's like <laughs> under the dark skies, somebody goes out and just dumps the sofa. <laughs> that happens all the time. It's yeah, just I'm strange. Anklote Road, I used to drive it three days a week, and one day it was not there, and the next day, I'm turning around, coming home the same road, about to hit the sofa. So it was not 3 o'clock in the morning. But I'm just saying, on the way home from that same event, all of a sudden there's a sofa in the middle of the road. So it does happen. Um, but, but yeah, even things like our bi biannual cleanups mm -hmm. could go on you know, the, the website. But again, it depends on... How easy is it to put on? How easy is, is it to take off? So yeah, don't, we don't want to over, you know, burden people who are already very busy. Mm -hmm. But it might just take them a second. And they don't really care, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But external links, I think, like where it says helpful links, the recycling guide, and things like that. External links, I think, if they're um, just standard links, you know, like I said, like if you're if you're looking for more information on. Um, keep it, it, oh, Tampa has one as well, right? Like a, I know it's Keep Pinellas Beautiful, and then Tampa has one. I don't remember what it's called. I think it's keep like Tampa Keep Tampa Beautiful. Bay Beautiful. Tampa Keep Tampa. Keep Tampa, <laughs> Tampa Bay. Beautiful. Keep Tampa Bay Beautiful. I think. <laughs> okay, but just things like that, where you know, if you if you literally just have the link to go to it, then you can search that website all you want. We don't need the rest of the information, but mm -hmm. that's that link isn't necessarily going to expire in three months, mm -hmm. so it's something that can be up there forever. Thank you for I, sharing information about that. You're welcome. I took more than my five minutes, but... No, sorry. that's we, fine. We had some extra from we some did. other things. We did. Thank you for whoever donated your minutes. And don't dump. Dumping sucks. Don't do that. 
<laughs> I can say that, right? Sure. I just did. All right. Um, so next is items for the next meeting agenda. So I think we do want to put a conversation about the website mm-hmm. on there. Yeah, if I understood correctly, it seems like there's two parts to that. One is some of the organizations specifically you might be interested in having there, and then the other is a further discussion about the website kind of procedure, recommendation, making recommendations, and those expectations as well. So that seems like a, like a two-part item, if I understood correctly. Yes, and if you could get us information about the ease so that we know ahead of the meeting, that would be helpful. Right. Like in the backup. Sure. Makes sense. And I think um, we talked about maybe a little bit more clarification on the Solar United Neighbors. Do you think it's possible for the representative to come at all? I might be, yeah. That'd be good present to us so that we have a better um, concrete understanding of, of the, the enrollment process? Because if it is an annual process, um, mm-hmm. just like getting your health insurance, you know, it'd be nice to know those dates and have those dates posted, then we wouldn't have to remove it from the website, but we just make the public aware that there's an enrollment that starts on date, you know, a certain date. It closes on, um, you know, in December. I saw that they did have a meeting, but it was on the same night that we had our last meeting. It was September 15th. Hmm. And um, right. I've really been interested to ask, you know, some of the questions that we've posed, you know, about the life span of solar panels mm-hmm. and if there's any, you know, if there's any information out there on that. Yeah, I would be happy to ask her um, if she'd be willing to do that. I imagine she would be, but, mm-hmm. she, you know, just making sure her availability would work. And, um, yeah, I'll, I'll make sure that, that she's available there. And, and regardless, um, a discussion item on solar and following up on some of those questions. Robin, as I recall, uh, didn't that resolution or agreement with Solar United Neighbors include uh, uh, some sort of commitment on the city to make social media posts or something of that nature? That we will help promote it in, in, uh, in whatever way is um, practical. That might be something to add on to our, our website discussion, be like a more comprehensive discussion of, you know, what's appropriate for the website versus social media, that sort of thing, because that's, mm-hmm. that's the other uh, main point of contact the city has with uh, our citizens is, you know, I think it's probably actually more important than the website. We probably get a lot more feedback on social media posts than we do on the website. Yeah, that's a good point. I think so, too. Okay. Yeah, that's a good, good point. Um, kind of goes back to maybe some sort of content guide for expectation. Mm-hmm. So I'll, um, I'll look into that. Um, I do have a few other things I had written down. Let's see. Um, I know that we had, I think, I think, Dory, you had suggested, I don't know if you were going to bring it up, um, a calendar of events for 2023 and how the sustainability committee could engage with those events. Yep. So what I was thinking, um, is having a discussion on the next, uh, meeting. It'd be nice to have, to see the city's calendar of events for the year and be proactively thinking about how we can plug into that. Mm -hmm. So like the touch a truck, Maybe that the sustainability committee has a presence there and has the electric vehicle there and can talk to kids about electric vehicles. Mm-hmm. Or Arbor Day, you know, we could go mm-hmm. help with passing out the trees or just engage more with things that the city's already doing so that we're kind of representing. Representing and then also, you know, just more public engagement, just more, you know, 
opportunities for, for engaging and, and making people aware of what we're doing. And so I, instead of just like, oh crap, next month is. <laughs> and driving the applications for the sustainability committee. So anybody out there? <laughs> yes, it's a lot of fun. wants to join us. A lot, a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. So, um, so that's, if, if, if you could, uh, I, th I think I would like to have that discussion if we could have the mm -hmm. hopefully there's that's already lined up what's happening in the city in 2023 I will find out <laughs> if that's available already so you were at the touch truck this last time so maybe the things that you're going to be at it were things that we should naturally be at but there might be some more things too but we could also go like um show up at like the garden club or someone who might be aligned with with our you know, mission and thoughts and so forth to just let, let people know who we are and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we talked about partnerships a long time ago, you know, and, and the likely combinations, you know, within the community. But I feel like um, it hasn't really been nurtured as much as it could be. And maybe this is the opportunity in order to get more people involved with the committee itself. Mm -hmm. well, now we can take a, bre a little breath after the star thing and all that, mm -hmm. a little mm -hmm. breather here. Yeah. And maybe even like a calendar for our meetings of community partners to come talk Ooh. to us, to share, you know what I mean? Like, and then brainstorm like how we can engage with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking like some of the social um, aspects, like, you know what I mean? Organizations that are not just environmental but more like on the social end of things mm -hmm. okay. Good. okay yeah and I can I can also come up with a you know some recommendations too for some events that um, might be good to do sustainability at um, uh, to that point also um, I could also give an update by then on our guest speakers for knowledge and nibbles um, mm -hmm which kind of speaks to that too about connecting with some of these community groups. Mm -hmm. So I'm still confirming some speakers, but um, I can give that update on, on um, who will be coming at our next meeting as well. Very good. And then next month, that should be enough time too to have an update on where we are with the current list of star or I guess we're not calling it star, of our action plan items? Um, I, I will try my best. I am still getting with all of the staff members um, to get their feedback. I'd like to come back with that kind of comprehensive staff feedback. Um, I could say we could tentatively put that action on for now, and that'll be my goal to have, have that ready for you all at the next meeting. Anything else? It's quite a few things. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. No, seeing no public comment, we can <laughs> skip over that. Staff comments? Um, I think I did have one, um, which was that we uh, applied for a grant through Resilient Florida, and it is basically um, supplemental funds for our vulnerability assessment. Um, it would provide about off the top of my head. I'm trying to think of the number off the top of my head. Um, but it would just allow for an expanded scope for the work, allow for a more thorough assessment and more public engagement if, if we do receive that supplemental grant. And we'll be hearing back in 2023 on that. Hopefully sooner rather than later since we've already kind of gotten started um, while we're we're still getting set up with our vulnerability assessment but um, yeah we'll be prepared in either either case is this the vulnerability assessment that that uh, Paul Smith referenced that mm -hmm. right. so this is going to be like in addition to that the, right. the grant we applied for Will they work together? 
They would. So uh, this would expand the scope of the project, and we have planned it out to where it would um, those additional items would take place in the later phases of the project, so that it doesn't delay us getting started. Right. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, just two items, just informational. Um, <clears throat> uh, just want to reiterate, I touched on it a little bit during the greenhouse gas discussion, but uh, last Friday we did have our kickoff meeting for phase two of the reverse osmosis solar project. We're very excited about it. It's a $1.3 million investment in solar energy for the city, which I think is a pretty big deal, and it's going to... Uh, triple our uh, solar energy capacity at the reverse osmosis plant. So that's pretty cool. The uh, time frame for installation, um, we talked about initial schedules. It's supposed to be done by sometime next summer, um, pending no supply chain issues. Um, we've seen a lot of supply chain issues on most of our construction projects lately, so we'll see how the schedule goes. But, uh, but we are excited to get started and, um, and get that kicked off. Uh, the one other item that I just wanted to point out is uh, we did have, uh, every year the city participates in the uh, Pinellas County um, School Board's Executive Internship Program for high school students. Um, we've had our intern, our, one of our interns start last week, and we got another one starting most likely uh, next week. Um, and for the first, they're going to get a little bit of the flavor of the city. They'll get to be uh, parked at different departments within the city, like the water plant and planning and zoning and things like that. And for the first time, we'll have a uh, sustainability program for them to spend at least a little bit of time with to learn something about sustainability. So doing a little bit of sustainability outreach for our high school kids. Mm. So is the intent to try to like encourage them to become like city employees at some point? Like <laughs> to join this yeah, to, like, <laughs> Are we like sucking them in? No, I'm, I'm uh, hy no, I mean Hypothetically, the, the, the current batch, I believe one wants to be a mathematician, the other one wants to be an aerospace engineer. So that's fairly unlikely, I think. But, um, hmm. but if they can learn a little bit about good civil governance, maybe they can grow up to be a good uh, member of their community wherever they wind up. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Um, that did also remind me, we are also hiring for a sustainability intern, another sustainability intern. Mm -hmm. um, that application is open now. And this intern will be helping me write the sustainability plan. Oh, excellent. And that will also be a temporary position, about 18 weeks, I believe. And is there a criteria? Are they um, currently in college, in out of high school? Like, was, what's the criteria for the... Um, for them to apply for. We have it, yeah, it's on the website. I think it, what we wrote is um, a current junior or senior as a minimum <clears throat> in college. High school, college. In college as a minimum requirement. Um, but if they are, you know, have a college degree or are in graduate school, that would be accepted as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Committee comments. Wow. I will send the link that I neglected to do for the um, environmental working group at CWG.org, and they have a tap water um, database that's really fascinating. You can just type in your um, zip code, and Tarpon Springs even comes up. Clear water, whatever the, and it tells you exactly what the water source is, what the contaminants are, mm -hmm. ones that are above limits, and you know, it's just educational. Huh. And I meant to send that to Robin, and I neglected to do it. I apologize. All right. Mm -hmm. Very good. Then I guess we will go ahead and adjourn at seven thirty-nine. Thanks all.